it's uh, nice to be here today. Um, that sound like I'm old, but when I went to OTC, we didn't have Starbucks on campus. It's nice. um, so, as uh, as he said, I'm in my third, my fourth term in the legislature. Um, I don't know how many of you have interacted with or worked with the government, um, either on the state or federal level, um, but. I'm going to start where the current position I have is, which is the Speaker of the House, because it's uh, fairly significant within the, in the legislature. We have um, every, every state legislature in the country has a very different type of government. Um, they're all elected, but you know, for instance, in Nebraska, there's only one legislative body. Um, in Missouri, like in Congress, there's a House and there's a Senate. Um, our House is a very top-down body, which means that the Speaker of the House and the majority of the carry a significant amount of power in the House. Uh, the last time I was here, I, I kind of broke the room down as if the house or the room was a, a legislative body and said, if you wanted to pass a bill, um, you filed a bill. Let's say you said we want to raise speed limits in the state to many miles an hour. If you filed that bill, that bill once once you file the bill actually comes to me. If I choose not to refer the bill to a committee, that bill is never going to get heard. Um, not only do I have the option to choose whether to re refer it to a committee, I also pick each member of each committee and each chairman of each committee. So I can send it to whichever committee I want to and I send it to people that, that I've worked with in the past and I think would understand it. If the committee passes the bill, the committee sends the bill back to me, then we have what's called the calendar. If I don't put the bill on the calendar, then we'll never debate it on the floor. Assuming I put the bill on the calendar, then we debate it on the floor, we vote on it, and whether we pass it or not, that, that, that's the process. But um, because of the way our structure or our body is structured, I have a lot of ability to, to stop legislation or to move legislation within the House. Um, one of the bright sides of being in the state government is that we never shut down, unlike the federal government. Um, so I ran for office back in 2012, um, but I got interested in politics when I was a lot younger. Um, I was homeschooled growing up, and I was born in Iowa. Um, in Iowa, we were one of the last three states in the country that homeschooling was technically against the law. Um, come on in, you don't have to worry about it. Um, if you, if you were homeschooling your children, we had friends that had lost their kids to do um, Department of Social Services. They said um, they considered their kids truant because they were not in school at the time. So when I was fairly young, my parents moved us down to Missouri. Um, but because of that, my parents would drag us to the Capitol every year. Um, at least a couple times a year, we with our, our reps and senators. And so I got very interested in politics and policy at a, at a, at a young age. Um, I think the first campaign I worked on, I was 10 years old. Um, about every two years after that, I was working on a campaign. Um, so I went to college, came here um, to OGC, graduated here with Missouri Western St. Joe, went to law school in Mizzou, moved back to Springfield, started practicing law, but always knew I wanted to run for, for office at some point. Uh, every 10 years in, um, in the country, we do the census and we redraw our political boundaries. And so um, we did the census in 2011, 2012, December of 11 or January of 12, I can't remember. They redrew new legislative boundaries and they drew a new district in South Springfield, which is where I am. Um, easiest way to remember is if you know where Bass Pro is in Springfield, Bass Pro is in the northeastern corner of my district. Everything in my district goes south and west of Bass Pro. Um, so I decided to run, run that year for the first time. Um, I'd worked on, like I said, a, a dozen campaigns up to that point, but the process of actually running for office is very different from the process of, of working on a campaign. Uh, phenomenal experience I've served now. I'm just beginning my seventh year. Um, I served two years as a freshman legislator um, with basically no ability to do anything other than vote. Um, then I served two years as the chair of the Emerging Issues Committee. Um, became kind of a catch-all committee, and so we had a lot of the really interesting things that, that we debated the legislature go through there. There's, there's about 35 committees in the House. There's some, like, pensions, which just deal with, like, teacher pensions, things like that things that I'm not necessarily super excited about working on. Um, emerging issues was great because emerging issues was a catch-all committee. So we debated medical marijuana, we debated um, whether or not to allow Uber to expand to a statewide framework. Um, there's, a, there's a bill that I was that, that was around when I was there, it's still around whether or not to um, require Tesla to sell their cars through existing auto dealer franchises. Um, anything, it, it, the nickname for those committees is the ATF committee because anything related to alcohol, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms goes through those committees. Um, so it was, it was a very exciting committee. We got to do a lot of interesting things. After that, I ran for Speaker Pro Tem, which is the number two position in the House. I spent the last two years serving as Speaker Pro Tem, and now I'm um, serving as Speaker of the House. Uh, he asked me to talk about why I identify with the Republican Party, and that's somewhat of a difficult question because um, 
I don't think anybody probably fits exactly neatly within their party party label or party identification. So I'm Republican primarily because I believe that traditionally smaller government is better. Government, for the most part, messes up the things that it's involved in. Um, so the government should do very few things and they should do them very well. Primarily, they should real, build roads and bridges, provide for the national defense of the country. Once you get past those few things, um, you start getting to a place where I think they, they start getting kind of outside their, their comfort zone. Um, great example of what I think the government does really badly on a federal level. Um, it's very timely because this happened this weekend, is uh, the U.S. Postal Service. Back when the country started, the U.S. Postal Service was super essential. It was a great idea. I understand why they did it. This weekend, stamps went up from 50 to 55 cents. But here's my problem with the Postal Service. We have a law, a federal law, that bans anyone else from delivering, delivering small packages or letters. In other words, FedEx, Amazon, UPS, you name it, they cannot deliver letters. So the, the Postal Service has a government-granted monopoly that they're the only ones that can deliver letters. They also don't pay taxes because they're part of government. So they're, they're, they're competing on an unfilled playing field. Despite this, they're losing roughly three to seven billion dollars per year every year operating this way. In my mind, if you said we're gonna, we're gonna get rid of the US Postal Service and we're gonna get rid of the ban on other people delivering mail, you know, Amazon the next day would have drones flying mail around. They, we'd have UPS, FedEx competing for the business and you, you, you again, drive, drive prices down and they find a way to do it in a much more uh, efficient manner. But that's an example of something the government program started 200 years ago that at the time the, the government was probably the only group that could, could, could stitch together the country with the Postal Service. But now it's essentially, in my mind, just, just the timing of it is it's an archaic program that needs to go away. Uh, this is the problem with the federal government. It's somewhat the problem with the state government is that the bigger government gets, the more areas it gets to, into. My, in my opinion, it doesn't do a very efficient job um, managing that. So, um, I'm going to real briefly talk about the issues that we're going to deal with this year. This may be painfully boring if you're not paying attention because it's the issues that we build, deal with on a bit daily basis are not ones that a lot of times people realize affect them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the big one is revenue. If you're paying attention to the state budget right now, um, every year we try to guess prior to the year how much money we're going to have to spend the next year. And so several groups get together, they look at economic trends and they say, okay, we think we're going to have X amount of dollars to spend next year. We call this the continuing revenue estimate. Um, right now we estimate that this year we're going to have roughly $29 billion to spend. We have a constitutionally mandated balanced budget in the state, so we're going to have $29 billion to spend. That's, that's, the, the, that's it. We can't spend more than that. The problem is, last year when we did the continuing revenue estimate, we had a guess as to how much money we're going to have this year. Right now, revenue is tracking about $500 million below where we think we're, we were supposed to be. Um, now, there's a big debate on why that is, um, but if that holds true, at some point, the governor's going to have to come in and start withholding some of the money that we appropriated to spend because we're going to be above the amount of money that we've generated. Um, it's, it's, it's not the most exciting topic in the world, but it's also one that's critically important in the state because if you're the government or governor and you've got $30 billion of budget and you have to decide where you're going to withhold money, obviously, if you decide to withhold it from higher ed or from K-12 or from the Medicaid program, you're going to have a lot of very frustrated, angry people who are counting on that money. And that, that's, of all the things that we're dealing with this year, that's probably the biggest one. Um, now, our hope is that the withholding tables that the Department of Revenue put out are just wrong and what, what's going to happen is by the time we get to April 15th and everybody's paid their taxes, we've recouped that $500 million. But uh, right now that's probably the most, um, the toughest thing that we're dealing with in Jefferson City. We've got a few things that the Supreme Court has gifted us as far as issues that we can deal with in, in Jeff City um, that are a little bit more interesting. One, sports gaming. Gambling on sports. Up until last year, only Nevada could allow people to gamble on sports in casinos. Now, a lot of people gamble on sports through online um, retailers that were, were, were tracked through offshore accounts. Um, last year, the Supreme Court said that's a violation of equal protection. Every state has the opportunity to do that. So right now, we're having a big debate in the state on whether or not we allow people in the state to set up uh, sports betting. Uh, it has become a huge fight between the leagues like Major League Baseball, National Basketball Association, NFL, versus the casinos. The leagues want them to be paid an integrity fee to help manage the game, make sure nobody's cheating, point shaving scandals, things like that. The casinos 
don't want to pay the fee and the casinos don't want anyone to offer the game except the casinos. And their argument is, we, we are already handling gambling. We know how to you know, make sure it's done correctly. We don't, we don't want anybody else to, to, to be managing these games. And that's one issue. Um, the second one is called video lottery terminals. If you drive over to Illinois, and you can even see them in Missouri even though they're technically illegal, but if you drive over to Illinois and you go to a gas station, you'll find a little room on the side that has like five or six little slot machines in it. Um, there's about 30,000 of those little um, rooms around the state. They generate about $400 million in tax revenue for the state of Illinois. There's five states in the country that allow this, uh, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Nebraska, Montana, and I think maybe a little in West Virginia. Um, there's a debate now whether or not we should allow video gaming in Missouri. Casinos are obviously against it. Their argument is, as people go to gas stations to, to play at the slot machine, they're not coming to casinos. Um, the groups that run these video lottery terminals, their argument is in Illinois, it generates about $400 million in tax revenue a year. It's a ton of money for the state, you should allow it. Um, and then there's also somewhat of a, a moral or public policy group that argues the expansion of gaming is bad, it leads to the breakdown, or it leads to the breakdown of families and things like that. Second thing, obviously there's a lot of stuff in the gaming space. Um, I referenced earlier the issues of Tesla, um, and this has been kind of an ongoing issue ever since I've been in the legislature, but here, here's, the, here's the debate we're having right now. Back in the, I think maybe like the 20s or 30s, um, we had real problems with people selling cars in the country. And what you'd have is nobody wanted to sell cars because they were like, five I open a Ford dealership, the next day, another Ford dealership might open up and they'll undercut me and I won't be able to sell. So we set up something called franchise laws. And franchise laws basically says that a group buys an area and that no one can compete against them in that area. So that's why there's one Ford dealership in Springfield, there's one Chevy dealership in Springfield. Well, that worked very well for a long time. Tesla doesn't do franchises. Tesla, you just buy your car online, you literally just get on there, you type what you want, and they just send it directly to you. It's a direct consumer type of sales. There has been a long fight in Missouri that the auto dealers in Missouri don't want um, to allow an, an organization like Tesla to bypass franchise laws. Their concern is not so much with Tesla, it's that some foreign company from China or India will come to Missouri and just say, we're gonna drop 200,000 cars that you can buy online, super cheap, don't have to go through a franchise on. Um, and so this battle has been playing out over the last few years, both in Missouri and in other states, New Jersey, Texas, um, Right, to say. So those are just a few of the issues we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Obviously, we deal with the traditional big political issues of abortion, taxes, guns, things like that as well. Um, but it's amazing when you run for office. I ran for office thinking those would be the big issues I would deal with. You get up there and you find out that the big issues we fight about are not about those, those big partisan issues. They're about little things like uh, the three-tier system of alcohol distribution in Missouri. It's super, there's a ton of money that goes through the system. There's constantly different groups that are trying to argue why we should change that system. That's what we spend most of our time dealing with, uh, with on a day-to-day -day basis. So, short kind of. So you uh, you spoke to us last year, and you said one of my favorite things I think I've ever heard. You said there is one way a bill could pass. There yes. are 60 ways a bill can die. Yeah. Can you explain that for like sure. a minute or two? Yeah. Um, so every year, our legislative session is from January to mid-May. Um, and then when the session's over and we start the next January, every bill that doesn't pass by the end of May, they'll start back at the beginning. And so the biggest, the biggest way bills die is bills die from time. They, they just run out of time to, to get a vote. Um, we usually have about 1,500 bills sponsored a year and we'll pass about 100 of them. Um, and so the, the, the running thing that we always say in the legislature is there's one way to pass a bill. There's actually two. There's, there's two ways to pass a bill and there's about 1,000 ways a bill can die. And so, kind of walking through the process. It's like the, the speed limit bill we talked about. You file a bill. The first thing that has to happen is I have to refer it. If I don't refer it, it dies. If I do refer it, I send it to a committee. If the committee chairman does not schedule it for a hearing, it dies. If he does schedule it for a hearing, and then after the hearing, they have to schedule a second time for a vote. If they don't schedule it for a vote, it dies. If they schedule it for a vote, it passes, and they, they choose not to turn the bill into the next next level, that bill dies. Let's say they schedule it for a hearing, they hear it, they vote on it, they pass it, and they turn it into the next level. Now it goes to a rules committee. Let's say that rules committee does not schedule for for a vote, the bill dies. Let's say they schedule it for a vote, and it passes, but they don't turn it back into the speaker, the bill dies. Let's say they turn it back into the speaker, and I don't put it on the House calendar, the bill dies. 
say I now put it on the house calendar, but the majority of floor says, even though it's on the house calendar, we're not actually going to take it up for debate on the floor. Bill dies. Let's see, he says, I'm going to take it up for debate on the floor, but I'm going to shut off debate before we schedule a vote. The bill dies. Let's say he says, I'm going to bring, take it up for a debate. We're going to perfect it. We're going to add an amendment to it. But after we perfect it, we're not going to take a vote on the third read. The bill dies. So let's say he says, OK, we're going to do all that stuff. We're going to take it out. We're going to third read. We're going to pass it. Now we've passed the bill. We've only passed it through the House. There's, there's at least 10 spots that I thought of in the House where the bill would die. And, and a lot of those is not just a vote. That's just we don't bring it up for a vote. Now that process replicates itself again in the state Senate, the exact same process. Bill goes over to the Senate, has to be like assigned to committee, voted on committee, passed, moved to the floor, passed on the floor. So that, that's another 10 ways it could die. So now we're at 20 ways the bill can die. But the problem is once the bill goes over to a different legislative body, they may amend it. And once they've changed it at all, even one comma that they change it, the bill has to come over to our body and it has to all happen again. So you've got this stuff going on the entire time with bills moving back and forth, but it's very, very difficult to pass bills. And a lot of times, you know, the whole trick, if, if you're trying to stop a bill from passing, is not to necessarily get a get it to fail in a vote. It's just to get it to run out of time. So you might, if you're if you're in mid-April, our session ends in May, and there's a bill that's passed the House that's in the Senate. Your entire goal may simply just be to add a small amendment to it, because if you add that small amendment, it goes back to the other side, and you just may run out of time to be passed. Uh, I have one question, and then we'll throw it to the sure. floor. Um, because I hear this a lot. We had a government shutdown that lasted a month plus. And you hear from people that are, uh, I'm not going to say conservative, I'm going to say anti-government, but I think there's a distinctive difference. I, they I, say, I'm pretty close to that. Okay, they say, um, well, good thing the government shuts down. The less our government does, the better. What is your response? Because I assume you're anti-shutdown. So, what's so, your response to that as a conservative? Well, first of all, it's important to talk about there are multiple different kinds of shutdowns. The shutdown we just went through was not a true shutdown. I think 85% of the government was still functioning. Um, the only the, the, the parts that were shut down was the 15% that was deemed non-essential. Some of them were being asked to work even though they weren't getting paid. But for the most part, everything was still running. Um, and so a true shutdown of the federal government is a, is a big problem. When you look back back in like the mid-90s when this the shutdown thing first became a real thing, New Gingrich and Bill Clinton were, were going to war, um, you actually had, I mean, everything was shuttered and, and people would show up to, to like apply for social security benefits and they would, the doors would be shut. Like things like that were a real problem. Um, I think the shut, I think shutdowns are a terrible negotiating tactic. Um, no matter who's trying to use it, I just don't think it works. If you look at it over the last, uh, since Reagan was president, six or seven presidents, only one president that was George W. Bush did not have a shutdown during, during his period in office. And I don't think anybody ever comes out of a shutdown looking better than they did walking into it. it just, it's not an effective tactic to, ne to negotiate, as we saw with President Trump. He really did not extract anything as far as getting a, a, a border wall, that, as far as I could tell. Um, so I don't think it's helpful. I, I don't think it does anybody any good. I think everybody comes out of it less popular than they walk in. OK, anybody have any questions for our speaker? I know we have uh, some folks that have prepared some questions, but anybody that would like to ask a like or a question? Prepared, prepared questions are the best. That's right. I haven't seen them, but. No, of course not. Jen, the state government is entirely less exciting than federal government. <laughs> well, let's talk about the state government a little bit, because this past November, we had a midterm election on the federal level. We had lots of state initiatives. And uh, we also had yourself and almost everybody up for election. Uh, Republican candidates like yourself crushed it, absolutely crushed it. And yet, a lot of these ballot issues seem to be a little less partisan. Some of them, maybe Republicans favor. Some of them, Democrats flat out favor. What do you explain why voters are supporting Republican candidates in droves, but kind of favor on at least a couple issues, more Democratic favored initiatives? So this is actually, um, if you study political history, this is a flip 20 years ago in California. Um, California was electing more and more Democrats, and yet all the ballot initiatives that were passed were very Republican, very conservative ballot initiatives. That's what we're having in Missouri on the opposite way. And I think a big thing is, is that, for the most part, our state traditionally is a fairly conservative state. Um, we're a fairly pro-life state, pro-gun, smaller government, things like that. There are some very select issues where um, I would say that the state as a whole is, is probably a little more liberal than the Republican Party. 
A great example of that, um, and one where I'm more in line with the state than with my party, is issues like marijuana, um, whether it be medicinal or recreational. Um, I think there's probably a new, uh, the younger generation of Republicans are 